Hello. Um, in this class, uh, we will discuss uh, briefly the uh, some of the state of the art uh, uh, flare and CME forecasting methods. Okay. Um, here are the uh, contents uh, I will be discussing. I will first discuss a little bit uh, some of the very basics of flares. Uh, actually, I will probably just uh, browse through uh, these, uh, this part of the, the class. There is a full class called uh, Sun, Solar Wind and more uh, available through this YouTube channel where you can find out the detailed discussion about the uh, basic underlying physics of for example coral mass ejections and flares. Most of the time in this class I will spend on discussing three uh, uh, new methods uh, that have been developed to capture uh, or, and, or try to address the question about uh, uh, flare and CME predictions. I will be discussing ASAP and MAG models and then also discuss a little bit uh, the new potential techniques, uh, flare prediction techniques associated with subservice, uh, sub photospheric uh, flows. And then at the end, I will uh, say a couple of words about the future uh, of flare predictions. Well, flares 101 um, the basic physical uh, picture associated with solar flares and associated CMEs is that free magnetic energy that is stored in the solar corona is converted in this very rapid uh, release processes into other forms of energy into uh, heating of the plasma into non-thermal uh, charged particle acceleration to electromagnetic radiation which is actually the form of energy uh, uh, that is the the uh, dominating form of uh, uh, type of energy released in flare itself, plasma waves and bulk flows. Okay. Um, in general, uh, there are three different types of things we need to be able to capture in order to start predicting flares, all the way from the first principles. We need to be able to capture the energy buildup phase. Uh, the buildup of especially magnetic free energy in the solar corona that will eventually lead to flare. We need to be able to capture the energy release process, the triggering of these flare and CME er eruptions. And at the end, we need to be able to also capture uh, the energy transport and the distribution of the energy to the, these different forms of energy after the triggering of the, the flare uh, eruption. Okay, so the ultimate CME and flare prediction model need to be able to capture all these three uh, kind of facets of the, the, uh, the eruptive processes in the solar uh, atmosphere. Um, again, these slides are actually from the Sun, uh, Solar, Wind and More class available through this YouTube channel. So I will not spend time on, the, uh, on, on this very basic. I'm just going to go and skip ahead and go into the, the kind of a main meat of, of this class at this guy to the end to discuss some of the state of the art uh, uh, models out there. Okay. So uh, in terms of forecasting of flares and CMEs, uh, you could argue that uh, uh, optimally, really from the physics viewpoint, uh, uh, one would like to forecast these eruptions using first principles. Using the first principles, mathematical description of the physics underlying these eruptions, and then solve these equations to provide this predictive capability. However, we do not understand the physics of these flares and CMEs well enough that we could build such an ultimate fully first principles models that would provide us predictive capability yet. Okay. Another problem that we have is that uh, our current observational capability is uh, quite severely constrained. Uh, especially uh, a big constraint is the lack of uh, 
coronal, coronal uh, solar atmospheric magnetic field observations. We really need uh, information about this um, magnetic field and the plasma configurations in corona uh, that we would have to feed to these predictive models to provide this first principles type of capability to predict uh, the flares and coral mass ejections. Okay, so still both the physics and observational capability are lacking uh, uh, from the viewpoint of getting kind of an ultimate flare prediction capability. However, uh, we have to do something, and and there are, are num a number a number of groups around the world that have worked on the flare prediction problem, and kind of a roughly speaking, uh, the uh, the current methods uh, that are out there and are usable already in real time environment can be divided into empirical and semi empirical approaches, and I will demonstrate these uh, types of approaches using three different approaches or the three different uh, models, if you will. I will discuss here ASAP model, I will discuss MAC4 model, and I will also discuss uh, briefly some of the new kind of exciting subservice flow-based flare, uh, 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 flare uh, potential flare prediction techniques. Okay, but let's start with the, the ASAP model. Uh, this is uh, uh, called ASAP comes from Automated Solar Activity Prediction Model. This is a, uh, an empirical uh, model developed by University of Bradford uh, in the UK. Uh, all the details of this model can be found from this Colac uh, paper that was published in space with a journal in 2009. So definitely go ahead and, and go get this uh, base paper to find out uh, all the uh, kind of dirty uh, details uh, of the the ASAP model. Okay. Um, anyhow, the ASAP model uses uh, SOHO uh, MDI instrument, or now the the latest versions use also higher resolution solar dynamics observatory HMI, both a uh, continuum uh, 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 and magnet magnetogram imagery coming from uh, these uh, instruments and uses uh, that imagery to predict the likelihood, uh, the probability of flaring activity within next 24-hour window. Okay. Um, the ASAP tool is uh, really composed of two different components. In the first component of the uh, tool or the model, SOHO MDI or SDO HMI data uh, uh, is used to build active region classification. And this is the first component. Then in the second component of the tool, uh, the active region classifications are used to uh, provide a flare prediction actual flare prediction coming out, out of the model. And this component is built using NOAA sunspot classification and flaring data uh, over extended time period. And, and this data is used together with neural networks to build the, the flare prediction component of the model. So let's go quickly through the other two components a little bit more in detail. So in this uh, a slide, uh, what I'm showing is kind of a graphical illustration how the first component of the model works. So uh, the model is MDI continuum or uh, STO HMI continuum imagery to build uh, a map of sunspot candidates. Uh, it uses image processing techniques together with thresholding to identify sunspots on the visible solar disk. Then the tool uses also the uh, magnetograms uh, from SOHO uh, or uh, now, nowadays from STO together again with image processing techniques and the uh, thresholding to identify active regions. And then these two types of information are blended to build uh, a picture of both combined active regions and, and sunspots. And that information is, is pushed to the neural network together with historical data to train the neural network to classify this type of data uh, or provide classification for this type of data in terms of Macintosh classification 
of the sunspot groups. So the neural network, for example, identifies the structure and the shape of the uh, sunspots, uh, penumbras uh, in the, uh, the active regions to provide information about the Macintosh classification of these sunspot groups. Okay, so that's kind of the basic process uh, in the first component, in the classification component of the ASAP model. Then we enter the second component uh, of the model, which is the, the flare prediction component. So now we have identified the active regions and we have obtained the Macintosh classification of the sunspot groups. That information is then fed again into another set of neural networks where uh, um, the net networks are used to provide uh, uh, prediction whether or not uh, there is a uh, chance for having flaring active region from the visible solar disk. Okay, actually, in this part, uh, the uh, the uh, the Bradford group has generated two different neural networks. In the first set of neural networks, uh, the model eats information about the sunspot area and Macintosh classification to provide. Uh, 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 kind of an all clear or not all clear prediction for the flaring activity. If the, the first neural network uh, pred uh, predicts that there is a chance for having uh, flaring activity on the, uh, the solar disk, uh, it will start analyzing uh, the, the Macintosh classification data, just Macintosh classific uh, classification data of individual sunspot groups through another neural network that has been trained using the historical data. And this second, comp uh, second neural network of the uh, flare prediction system uh, provides then uh, actual probabilities of having CM or X-class flaring, act uh, flaring activity from individual uh, active regions. Okay, so in a way, uh, the ASAP model is is, is form of a uh, black box that uses neural network uh, techniques to capture photospheric signatures in the continuum imagery and in magnetogram imagery uh, pertaining to flare activity. Okay, here's an example of a basic uh, uh, a real time display uh, of the tool and and this tool uh, is actually or the output from the tool is available uh, via ISWA. So let's go to ISWA now to check out how uh, the, the tool actually looks like there. So this is my standard standard space of the prediction display and ASAP is always there as well. So let's let's uh, make this a little bit larger uh, right there. Um, so this is the, the situation uh, coming from the uh, model or the tool uh, at the time of recording this uh, class. Uh, so the, the top bar now gives the, the uh, full disk flaring uh, likelihood and this is obtained by eating that Macintosh classification information for individual uh, sunspot groups. Right now the model indicates that there is a 14% chance of having flaring activity somewhere on the, uh, the, on the uh, solar disk. Then the second component gives these uh, likelihoods of M and X class flaring activity for individual identified sunspot regions. So we have, or the tool has identified here in this case, eight different regions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different regions. And this table now gives information about the each individual identified sunspot region, okay? For example, if we look at the uh, sunspot region uh, number three here, which is on the eastern limb uh, of the solar disk right now, uh, the model provides uh, this uh, CKO uh, uh, type of a classification. And maybe even more importantly, it gives you the, the probability of having uh, M class and X class flaring activity from this region. Right now, the tool says that there is 18% chance of having uh, M class flare taking place within next 24 hours from the region number three, and 6% chance of having X class flaring activity uh, from uh, this active region. Okay, so definitely go check uh, the, the the model uh, through ISWA. Check out the model through through the, the ISO displays. Um, 
Let's then move to a Mac 4 model, which is another uh, type of flare, uh, state of the art flare prediction model. Uh, this is now a semi empirical, uh, uh, more of a semi empirical type of model, which is developed by University of Alabama in, uh, in Huntsville. And, and this model is described in detail in Dave Falconer's paper that appeared in Space Weather 2011. Uh, just to show you the title of this thing, let's see, Falconer here. Uh, so that's a space weather 2011 paper, uh, 2011 paper, and and again, go uh, get this paper if you really want to learn uh, all the details uh, about the model and how it works, the, the 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 statistics behind the model, the physics behind the model, and and so forth. Okay. But let's just you know discuss uh, very briefly some of the the key key uh, uh, concepts used in the model. Similarly to uh, um, ASAP model, uh, the MAG4 uh, uses, um, well actually that's a mistake, it's not using uh, the, the continuum model, so, so ignore this. Um, the the MAG4 uses SOHO MDI and SD, uh, now in the latest versions it uses SDO HMI magnetogram imagery. Okay, so it uses only magnetogram imagery. Uh, not 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 continuum imagery to predict the likelihood of flaring CME and also solar energetic particle activity within next 24 hour window. So the window is the same as with the ASAP model. Now, in contrast to ASAP model, there is also a little bit more of the physics built into the model. Uh, more specifically, the model uses magnetic free energy proxy. To quantify the state of the active region, and this is really the, the kind of the physics uh, uh, component uh, of the, the Mac 4 model. And in the actual prediction part of the model, uh, uh, these folks use SOHO MDI data and flaring CME and SCP catalogs from from NOAA for years 1996 through 2004 to build the kind of an empirical uh, predictive part of this model. So in the model, this magnetic free energy proxy is used to provide the parameterization for the state of the photosphere or the corona, and then empirical part provides the, uh, the capability to actually provide uh, the prediction for flaring CME and SCP activity, okay? Um, so how the model works? Also, MAG4 starts with the uh, automated kind of pen recognition or image processing part where it identifies active regions uh, from MDI and now more lately from STO HMI magnetograms. It uses image processing techniques such as Gaussian smoothing uh, operations to the, the, the imagery and thresholding to extract these active regions from the MDI or HMI uh, magnetograms. And once the active regions have been uh, identified, uh, the model assigns them to a corresponding NOAA active regions uh, 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 that have been uh, uh, developed or assigned by the uh, NOAA Space Prediction Center folks. Um, so uh, let's go to the next one. To discuss uh, how the magnetic free uh, the, the uh, free magnetic free energy proxy is used in the model. So here's now uh, an example of uh, identified active region from the step one of the Mac four model. So the color coding here now gives the intensity of the line of sight component. Uh, I believe this is in from SD uh, Soho uh, uh, MDI instrument data. Then in the next step, MAG4 goes ahead and identifies so-called polarity inversion lines that separate the two different polarities. So the white, uh, the, the, uh, the white color and black color ident uh, indicate two different polarities in this line of sight component of the photospheric magnetic field. So the, the tool or the model identifies where this line of sight component changes sign. That's the, what we call polarity inversion, inversion line. And then comes the, the magic of the physics part of the model. Uh, what these folks then do, they integrate 
the gradient of the line of sight component across this polarity inversion line along the polarity inversion line throughout the active region okay so they calculate the gradient of the line of sight across uh, the, the polarity inversion line and then integrate that quantity throughout the entire active region and this is what they call weighted length of the strong gradient neutral line and this is now the proxy for free magnetic energy in the system uh, Falconer et al have shown that uh, with other types of data including vector magnetogram data that this proxy actually correlates very well with the, the non-potentiality of the magnetic field uh, in, 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 the, in the photosphere and in the solar corona okay and then <clears throat> In the prediction phase, uh, uh, the, these folks build actual empirical model, okay? And here's uh, data from their statistics. So they used the data from, uh, let's see, from 1996 to 2004 to build uh, uh, these statistics. And in the statistics, they correlate uh, this uh, magnetic, free, free ener uh, magnetic free energy proxy to the event rates, okay? For uh, for given a 24-hour window, okay, and they give statistics for event rates both for all major flares, X-class flares, for CMEs, fast CMEs. Uh, in their uh, uh, classification, fa fast CMEs are CMEs with plane of sky speed component greater than 800 kilometers per second and then also they provide statistics for correlation between the magnetic free energy proxy and the solar particle events okay so how the predictive phase of the model works uh, they uh, the the model goes ahead takes the uh, calculates the uh, the measure uh, uh, of for the you know the proxy for the magnetic free energy uh, number uh, for the active region and then checks the corresponding number on the horizontal line here then we'll go to the top and that gives on the vertical axis the uh, likelihood of having uh, of having for example flaring activity from that active region okay so these statistics allow the the coupling of the the this magnetic free energy proxy to the the estimate uh, expected event rates for X flares, CMEs, and, and solar uh, uh, particle events, okay? And pushing, putting uh, all that together into uh, one single uh, uh, display uh, provides the, uh, the real-time view to the model. Now, the model is actually, the model output is available already through uh, this URL, uh, and the, the, the output hopefully, uh, or potentially, will be available also through integrated space of the analysis system. It's not there yet, so you're going to have to go to this website if you want to check the, the real-time output from this model. Uh, what is displaying, uh, displayed in, uh, in this uh, standard output uh, are the, the identified active regions um, that are uh, numbered here. And for each active region, uh, the model gives uh, uh, the flare -like, uh, likelihood for, for having flaring activity. And, and green and those are shown with green uh, yellow and, and red colors uh, the blue regions uh, indicate uh, identified active regions that do not have corresponding NOAA active region assignments in addition to that uh, the model also gives the full disk uh, uh, event uh, probabilities uh, so here, for example, the, this uh, what they call thread gauge gives likelihood for X and M class flaring, CMEs, fast CMEs, X class flares, and solar particle events. Uh, the other red bar here, which is barely visible in this case, gives the likelihood for having that type of uh, activity within the next 24 hour, hours. The green bar gives the all clear probability, what is the likelihood of having not having any kind of activity for a certain type of activity throughout the visible solar disk and then the the yellow bar here gives the the error bars uh, for these event no event uh, probabilities okay so that's the basic structure 
of the Mac 4 model and, and, and definitely go ahead and check this website to see how how this model is doing uh, or what the other, what type of output it gives uh, uh, in real time environment. Then finally, uh, let's discuss a little bit of the, the kind of a new uh, next generation type of flare uh, prediction uh, tools uh, that are uh, uh, starting to emerge. And here we're talking about scratching the surface and these new techniques are based on subsurface flows, uh, sub photospheric flows, okay? And the key high idea here is that the, the flux emergence, the, the magnetic flux emerging beneath the photosphere is believed to play a central role in the active region evolution, okay? And again, go and check the, the Sun, uh, Solar, Wind and more class to, to have a more detailed discussion of this aspect of the, the solar phenomena. And now what is really cool uh, uh, with, in the connection of this idea is that, uh, for example, Gong uh, network provides subsurface plasma flow maps using these helioseismic uh, techniques. Uh, Gong, for example, provides uh, these subsurface, uh, subphotospheric uh, surface uh, plasma flow maps between uh, depths of 1 to, say, 16 megameters or so. Okay, now the idea is that the subsurface flow maps, for example, obtained through Gong, contain information about the emerging, future emerging uh, uh, magnetic field structures, and that may give us keys to start generating long lead time uh, uh, flare predictions. And this is something uh, of that, uh, okay, well, here's an example of a uh, uh, Gong, I believe this is Gong uh, uh, f uh, subsurface flow map. Uh, this is from European Helio and uh, us Aster Seismology uh, uh, Network. So the top panel shows the uh, uh, synaptic uh, plasma flow, uh, subsurface plasma flow at the depth of eight megameters below the uh, the photospheric uh, 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 plane uh, or the photospheric height, and the vectors here now show the, uh, the direction and the magnitude of the flow, plasma flow in that layer, okay? And now this is something that we wish to start using to build flare predictions. And really exciting work towards this goal has been carried out by Reynard et al. in their Astrophysics Journal Letters paper from 2010. Let me just show you the paper again, the paper title for that one too. Um, oops. So here's the paper, uh, this is Astrophysics Journal Letters 2010, and, and again, uh, get this paper to learn really the, the details uh, of their work and the details uh, of the, the methods that they use to extract information about the, okay? So, let's go back here. Um, so what the uh, Reynard et al. did was that they used these subsurface flow maps to calculate first what we call kinetic helicity density, uh, uh, age. Uh, and that age is defined here. So you calculate, you know, the V here is now the subsurface flow obtained, for example, from, uh, um, obtained from these helioseismological observations. So you calculate the curl of that flow and then you carry out, do the, the scalar product between that curl and the, uh, the, uh, the plasma flow vector itself. And that's called kinetic helicity density, okay? And now Reynard et al. calculated a kind of a derived parameter from, uh, for, for this kinetic helicity density. What they calculated was localized. Now localized mean that they averaged the kinetic helicity density over the entire individual active regions and calculated for that localized parameter so-called normalized helicity gradient variance, NHGV. And that parameter is defined here. So what they took, what they did is that they took the, uh, the uh, averaged uh, helicity uh, density and essentially calculated the, uh, the time derivative of that uh, uh, helicity density for each layer uh, in the uh, Gong maps. And then they integrated over 
layers of the Gong maps. So, so they, in, in a way, they cal calculated depth averaged or depth integrated time derivative of the, of the helicity in this first component of the NHGB parameter. Then they took also or calculated the gradient, the vertical gradient of the average uh, kinetic helicity density. And again, kind of a depth in, in depth integrated this vertical gradient of the helicity uh, uh, density and then multiplied this with the uh, the first component of the parameter so this is kind of a measure how much change there is in the kinetic helicity density both in temporal sense and in spatial sense in these uh, subsurface flow maps okay and this is then hope to give information for example these emerging structures uh, below the, the photosphere, all right? And uh, this is the, the core result of the uh, from the Reynard et al. paper. So what they did, they analyzed, let's see how many uh, years they analyzed, do I have information about that? Uh, they, uh, they uh, oh, here it is. Uh, they analyzed two, uh, 1,023 different active regions and their evolution over time to, uh, to derive this data. And what is shown here, uh, on the horizontal axis, we have uh, days from the actual flaring activity. And on the vertical axis, we have uh, the normalized value for this NHGB uh, uh, parameter. And they divided the data for uh, no flare data, for C-class flaring activity, M-class flaring activity, and X-class flaring activity. Okay, And what they uh, observed was that there was very interesting relationship, uh, the interesting trend that this parameter NHGV started to increase until there was a flare activity, after which the, the same parameter started to decrease again. And there was a very clear separation in this parameter that characterized the, the subsurface plasma flows between X-class, M-class and C-class flares. Okay. So clearly these subsurface flows contain information about this different uh, flaring activity at these different classes, okay? So, in short, this line of research that uses information from these subsurface flows is a really exciting kind of a new way of trying to look at the, the long lead time uh, flare prediction capability. And, and this is something that, that definitely will be playing a role in the, uh, the future uh, flare prediction prediction activities, especially looking at the, the longer lead time predictions for, for flaring and, and the CME activity. Okay, uh, the final piece is uh, what we can expect in the future. Um, right now, uh, at the recording of this uh, class, um, there are new NASA li li Living with Star projects uh, that has just started. Uh, their kickoff was early May this year. And these projects really try to have focused attack uh, on the problem of first principles, fully physics-based modeling of the solar eruptions that include all key three components of the flaring and CME activity. These uh, activities look both at the energy buildup process in the, uh, the active regions, they look at the triggering of these eruptions and also they look at the, the energy redistribution and transport after triggering of these eruptions. So definitely these new projects uh, hopefully will really provide new light uh, uh, to, the, uh, the, to the problem of first principles uh, uh, modeling and, and, and predictions of the, the flare and CME activity. And now the uh, one of the additional cool things uh, with these projects uh, uh, is that uh, the models, these all these models will be delivered to Community Coordinated Modeling Center, to CCMC, uh, operated at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So all these models will be available for the entire international research community for the years. So definitely stay tuned once these models start to appear at CCMC, and then we really hope that these new new models will push our capacity to use the first principles models. Uh, in the in the in the, in the, in the future uh, flare prediction activities, and that's the end of this class. Thank you very much.